much for the nice introduction. So let me see if I can get rid of this. Um, the, this is, uh, well, thank, uh, the, thank you so much for the organizers for giving me once again an opportunity to give a talk in this wonderful conference. It has been more than about 13 years since I came here from the first time. So then it's kind of hard to believe. But um, anyway, so uh, this is a young work in progress with Peter Bubenek at the University of Florida. This has a lot to do with applications or representation theory of finite dimensional algebras to topological data analysis. Now, I'm far from being an expert in TDA. So then for the people in the audience that know better than me in this, uh, about this topic, so please apologize if I make something that is wrong or terrible or something like that. So then, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, first of all, so methods of representation theory of quivers are being applied in topological data analysis to obtain like a, a very, very meaningful results. So for example, the interval decomposition theorems for categories of persistent modules. And then I have only three examples, but the list is very, very long at the, at the moment. So uh, I would say that the, the work of Crowley Bowie started all these trends of people in representation working, uh, representation theory of algebras working in TDA. And then there have been people that uh, have provided many, many interesting results. So then I'm just going to go over this uh, results. So then Crowley Bowie talk about the composition of point wise finite dimensional persistent modules over the real numbers. He was more general than this, but then this basically what he does. Uh, now here we are looking at the real numbers as opposed with the re with the usual order of real numbers, and then Bodman talk about the composition of point-wise finite dimensional persistent modules over this uh, quiver, which is they call the ZZ quiver, or the they say a quiver of type H one, but then it's going like this, so we, we call it the zigzag quiver, and then <clears throat> a, a scholar and Hirioka. They talk about you know, commutative ladders of finite type. So then they are talking about quivers that look like this. And then, well, they have some relations or so commutative relations here. And then they, they are trying to talk about a multivariable persistence modules here. And they, they use the Icelandic range quiver in order to describe the persistence diagrams corresponding to a uh, persistent modules over this commutative ladder. So then there are many, many other approaches to different types of situations now in the literature, but then I just wanted to focus in, in, uh, on, this, on these two. And then <clears throat> the thing is that uh, last year here at Canite, so the that the category of persistent modules over the A sub n, so directed, so the A sub n directed, so then it's just like this, right? Then, so then it has in vertices and they are all directed, so they use the linear algebra, right? And then um, they, they talk about, about the, 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 they talk about the derivative category over, over this, but then they use something that is very important. And uh, the fact is that this category is hereditary. So in particular, every complex in the bonded derivative category here is quasi-isomorphic to its own cohomology. And then they define what they call derivative interleaved distances between complexes in this category. So then, I'm, I'm going to go over some of the details. So then you have here a complex in this derivative category, and you say that it's quasi-isomorphic to its own cohomology, provided that the complex is quasi-isomorphic to this complex. So then it just has the entries, the cohomology groups of the complex, and the, all the differentials are equal to zero. So then, so then uh, that, that certainly can be, can be generalized to hereditary categories because every hereditary category has that property. But then 
Well, so then they, 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 they use the inter, interleaved distance between modules. So then let me just uh, review that very quickly. So then you have delta a non-integer, non-negative integer. And then we say that two persistent modules M and N uh, over A sub N directed are delta interleaved if there are morphisms of this kind and this one, so such that the following diagra diagrams are commutative. And this one and this one. So then you can think this as the, the module obtained from, from M by translating the vertex uh, delta units towards the left. So it's like, works like uh, the shifting functor. But then um, the, the thing is that if you have two complexes in the, the bonded derivative category over A sub N directed. So then we say that they are derived delta interleft, provided that each of the cohomology groups, they are delta interleaved in the usual sense. And then, so then here's where they use strongly the fact that every complex is quasi isomorphic to its own cohomology, such that this distance, this, this definition is well defined. And then from there, so then they talk about the derivative interleaving distance, and then the, the, the between two complexes is just defined as the infimum of all the deltas that are non-negative, such that the complex X and Y are derived delta interleaved. So then, <clears throat> that's, uh, that certainly is nice. But um, the question is, again, is that, well, can we discuss other distances for derived categories of persistent modules? Now, something that is very, very interesting uh, is that they use the, the derived equivalences in order to obtain a resource for the derived categories of six persistent modules, which are of major interest in people in TDA. And then, so remember that this by Happer theorem, so then this category, the triangular category is equivalent to the one with the, this is the CSAC quiver. Now, <clears throat> if the reason they, they are in TDA, they are always looking for better distances. So they, they have a number of well-known distances, the bottleneck, bottleneck distance, they have the Wasserstein distance, they have the interleaving distance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then it is, you want to, to, to choose the right distance in order to analyze data, depending on the situation that is given to you. And then here is a motivation. And then this comes from, from uh, unsupervised learning. So then you have a bunch of data and then you want to interpret that data. So how that data is associated with each other. And then they have two methods in, in statistical learning or supervised learning. One method is called k-means clustering and another one is hierarch hierarchical clustering, right? So then they are going to compare clusters of data by using distances. So the most common one is the Euclidean distance, but then it has been proved that sometimes the Euclidean distance is not the best way to compare to, to clusters of data. So for example, for here, hierarchical clustering, sorry, hierarchical, practical, well, sorry about that. So then they have several ones. So then this is the complete linkage. So then they, they, the idea is that they try to compare the two ones that are like far away from each other and they make it together. They have the single linkage. So then that's the, they compare the ones that are closer and then they have the average linkage and the central linkage. And then they have the k-mean clustering. So then you have a bunch of data, you divide that data at random into k groups, and then you start to uh, make clusters by using the points that are closer to the centroids for each of these, of these clusters. So then what, what is the idea? The idea is to reduce the within cluster mean square error. Because then this also takes care of the noise of the data and things like that. You also avoid overfitting the data and things like that in order to, to do predictive analysis on data. But 
again. So we want to call, take this to the topological data analysis and to the persistent modules. So then that is the main, the main uh, reason that we care about the new distances, at least that's why I believe. And then another important tool is to create, create a statistical tools from TDA. So for example, you from a persistence diagram, you have what is called a persistent landscape. And then from those persistent landscapes, you can think of these persistent landscapes as a random variables. And then they are going to have a mean, they are going to have a variance, and therefore you can talk about the central limit theorem and do a statistical inference from all these situations. But another important goal is that you are able to implement this into a computer. So then you don't want to create a theory that is way too abstract that cannot be implemented in a computer. So people in business, they use many, many other programs. So then the ones that I know are R and Python. So for these two programs, there are packages called TDA that do all this kind of thing that we are doing. And then for R, the, the TDA package also deals with uh, persistence landscapes. But again, this is the main goal of people in TDA. So in algebra, we have the tendency to generalize things, but then if we want to do things with TDA people, so we have to keep this goal always in mind. So it may be interesting for us, but then we also want to share that information with the people over the other side of the bridge. So then, <clears throat> so the, the, that's, the, that's the, the first question. And then the second question, well, what can we say about other triangular categories? For example, about the stable category of Frobenius category. As we, we learned this morning, that is also a triangular category. Can we talk about these kind of things in, the, in, in, in that context? Okay, so then let me just introduce a sub weights for abelian categories. Um, so this is a category and O is a class of obvious in D. So then a weight is just a function that goes from, from this class of objects to the interval zero to infinity. And then I'm allowing to have infinite weights here. Now, a, a symmetric Laguerre La metric or no, is just a, a function that goes from this to, to this one. So then it's a, it's a function into variables actually. So they, they should be here, the cross product there, such that they satisfy these three properties. So then the, the distance of an object to itself is equal to zero. The distance is symmetric and also satisfies the triangle inequality. Now, we are going to assume the following property that the, the, our distance is not going to distinguish uh, among, among uh, objects that are isomorphic in the category. So that means that if X and Y are isomorphic in the category, then the, their distance is equal to zero. Now, now uh, from now on, when we have this special C, that means that it's an abelian category, and then this curly B is going to be a subcategory of C. And then we are going to, the, to, to fix a weight W on the, on the subcategory B. Now, W is subadditive, provide that you have the direct sum of two objects in B, then the weight of the direct sum is less than or equal to the sum of the corresponding, or the weights of the corresponding um, uh, direct sums of these two. Now, <clears throat> we are to, going to denote M sub M, the class of morphisms from X to Y in C, such that the kernel and core kernel of F are both objects in the category B. Now, so then we can talk the, about the weight of a morphism of this kind by considering the weight of the kernel plus the weight of the core kernel of F. So then if we have two objects, X and Y and C, so then we call a B zigzag between X and Y, a sequence of morphisms that go like this. 
And then, but then we want that each of these morphisms, they belong to M of B. So then that means that the kernel and co-kernel are objects in the subcategory B. And then we can define the cost of gamma of the zigzag corresponding to the weight W by just adding the, the, the weights of each of these morphisms. So then <clears throat> in that situation, we define this distance. So we are going to say that, 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 that that's a distance just in a second, and which is going to be the infimum of all the costs for the, and then the infimum goes over all possible zigzags between X and Y, such that satisfies that each of the components of the zigzags uh, belong to this M of B. Then um, turns out that DW is symmetric on the category C, and that metric is called the path metric defined by the weight w. So, um, first of all, so then uh, examples of weights that we can consider here are, for example, the dimension of a vector space. We can also talk about the projected dimension of a module of a finite dimensional algebra, et cetera, et cetera. Now, <clears throat> we have the following definition. So then we are going to define, uh, I will call this the norm of X corresponding to the metric DW, but well, so then the less, let's not call it the norm, but then it seems like something like that. And then it's just going to be the distance between the object X to the zero object. And then we are going to denote this, the, that norm, restricted to the subcategory B. And we say that W is stable if this norm is just equal to the weight W. And we say that W lowers bound is path metric provided that for X and Y in B, we have this inequality right here. So then um, in, what, in what follows, I'm going to assume that B is a thick subcategory of C. So then that means that satisfies the two out of three property. So then that means that if you have, let me just write it down here. Let's say that you have, you have a short exact sequence, nay. And in C in this situation with two, two of in B, then the third is also in B. So that's the two out of three property. And then we say that, let me just erase that, so that is out of the way. We say that um, this uh, weight W is exact, provide that for every short exact sequence in B, then we have that the, the weight of X is less than or equal to the sum of the weights of Y and C, and the weight of Y is less than or equal to the sum of the weights of X and C, and so on. Then we have all these three properties. So then a theorem proved by Bubenik and his collaborators is the following. If we have that C and B and W are as above with B also thick, then the following conditions are equivalent. First, that W is exact, W is stable, and W lowers bound is path metric. Okay. So then um, now I'm going to, to, to talk a little bit about how this relates to, to, to the leg measures. So then we assume that P is in a small category whose sets uh, of objects has a measure uh, mu. So for example, think P like the real numbers and mu the Lebesgue measure. And then assume that C has a no projective injective objects and that B has a weight W. And then you are, you are going to assume that B is close under kernels and co-kernels, right? And then this guy, 
is the abelian category of persistent module. So then what they call a persistent module is something that goes from P to C. So then you can think uh, C, for example, the category of vector spaces over, over a field K. And then B can be, for example, the category of finite dimensional vector spaces over the same field. So then um, we are going to consider this. So T should be more W, be the class of persistent modules M here, such that a M of P belongs to B for all uh, objects P in, in, this, in, in this set. And this W of M is more integrable. So then we obtain an exact weight. So then that we call C composite, uh, sorry, more composite uh, W on this category of objects in the or persistent modules uh, define the following way. So then we have mu or composite W of M. So then it's going to be this integral. And then this integral is just equal to this. So then um, what, what we have here is that if W uh, uh, and V and W are exact, then, so then for persistent modules M and N in this category of objects of persistent modules, we have this inequality. Now, uh, this inequality was useful for Bubenik and his collaborators in order to provide a, another version of the Wasserstein distance between persistent modules, but by using path metrics. So then when you talk about abelian categories, at least in representation theory, so at least the first question that comes to my mind is that can we take that to triangular categories? So then, well, let's think about what happens in the derivative category or what happens in, in, in other triangular categories. So then, so then here's where uh, my work with Peter Bowen got started. So then, uh, we talk about triangular categories and I suggested a definition of exact weights and path metrics for triangular categories by using the properties of triangular categories that I know so far. So then we are going to assume T be a triangular category and then W be a subadditive weight on, on, on S. So then S is a triangular subcategory of so then in particular, uh, uh, S is stable under the suspension functor and it satisfies the two out of three property, but for triangles. So then we say that it's exact. And then this is a definition that I feel that is right. But then there may be a better definition for this, that when you have a triangle, so then exact triangle here in, in S, then you have a similar version that we had before for a, a short exact sequence. So <clears throat> let's consider F a provenance category and F sub bar the stable category of F. So then if we have a W sub bar and a sag weight defined on objects in this triangular category, then this guy defines an exact weight in uh, W on F such that it's going to assign zero to all the projective injective objects in, in F. And then um, I think I have some explanation. I forgot to mention something, but then let me just go over this first. So then um, like that's, that's rather simple to prove. So then you have two objects that are isomorphic in the, in the triangular category. So then they have the, then X and Y. So then when you leave them to the Frobenius category, so then these two are isomorphic for a certain uh, projective injective objects I and J. And then that immediately you can, you can check that the, this new, the weight of X is going to be equal to the, to the weight of Y. 
And again, we use strongly the fact that the W bar is equal to zero for any projective and injective object in us. And then as for exactness goes, so then you have a short exact sequence in F, then you have an induced triangle in the, well, here is in the, in the triangulate category. And then you just have to check that indeed. So since you have that it's exact in triangle category, indeed, so satisfies that W is exact in the Frobenius category. So um, all these properties seem to work a lot better for a stable categories or Frobenius categories. For derivative categories, uh, I think there are things that need to, 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 to look at, but so far, for Frobenius categories is being pretty good. Now you have also the, the conversely that you have an exact wave on F such that W is minimal with respect to the property that W sub I is equal to zero for all the projective objective objects I in F, then you, de you, have, you define an exact wave in the triangulate category. And again, you use the fact that every triangle in the in the stable category comes from a, a short exact sequence in the full category. So then <clears throat> I also propose this definition. So then now you have a, a zigzag between two objects X and Y in, in T is going to be a sequence of morphisms. So similar to the situation before, but from now on, we are going to assume that the mapping con for each of these morphisms is going to be an S. So then remember that, that one of the, of the axioms of triangular categories that you can always fit a morphism into a triangle. And then that third, so then that third uh, term in that triangle is what we call the mapping con. So then we require this to be a zigzag provided that the mapping con for each of these morphisms is in S. So then, so then uh, we also define the cost. So then now the cost is defined exactly in the same way as before. But then notice that here we don't really care anymore about kernels or co-kernels. We just care about the ways of the of the, of the mapping terms. And then we define a, a path metric. In the in the same way as it was done for abelian for abelian categories. Now, so then this result is rather straightforward, and and I believe it turns out easier to prove than for abelian categories because we don't have longer to check co-kernels and co-kernels. We just have to check at the mapping con, and then that makes the calculations a lot faster. But then we got this extra thing that when it's exact, when W is exact, so then the, the distance is an isometry with respect to the suspension function. Then we also call that the path metric relative to the, to the weight W. But is it going to be a path metric uh, over the triangle, triangular category uh, T? So, <clears throat> This is a, another result that turns out a lot simpler to prove than the version for abelian categories. So then this shows also the, the, the power of triangulate categories in this approach. And then um, uh, this is just a version of the result that Google had for abelian categories. But here there is this extra thing that we need that W is a stable under the under the, the suspension function. Um, now, when it's exact, so then it has to be a stable on the suspension functor, but that follows almost immediately from, from the following fact. So then the, this is the identity morphism. So then the mapping con has to be isomorphic to zero. But then you can also use the fact, one of the, I think it's the second axiom of triangular categories that if you have that this is a triangle, this is also a triangle. And then since it's exact and the, the, the way of the zero objects is zero, so then you obtain these two inequalities and therefore you have the equality. 
So then, does that? Now, <clears throat> I'm, I like provenius categories a lot. So there are tons of provenius categories that uh, uh, I use in my research. For example, the category of Gorenstein projecting modules that are finally generated. So that's, that's, that's my favorite one. So the, the stable category of modules for a provenius algebra, et cetera. So there, there are those, and then those are the ones that interest me the most. Um, so then we came up with this term. So then this is the version of the, the, of, of the theorem that we have with collaborators, but now I'm assuming that F is a, su, is a full subcategory of the persistent modules from P to C, that is for Venice. And then we have, we have all these properties. So now we need a W of in the injective projective objects. Each, each of these guys evaluated at P is equal to zero. And then we obtain a, a similar result for this. But now this is going to be in the triangular category. But the most uh, interesting thing I believe is this fact That, the, that if you want to take the distance uh, over the several categories, you might as well just focus on the distance in the, in the, in the full category. Now, the, the, we need this. We need the fact so that the, this is true. Otherwise, this won't make any sense. Okay, so then <clears throat> this looks nice and all, but then we want to look at like a provide an interesting example and a motivation to keep forward to this. So then this is far from, you know, from being over. So then we are still getting results, trying to figure this out, trying to figure, figure out if those are the right definitions, et cetera, et cetera. But then um, uh, I was looking to, to provenius categories that are continuous. And then I read the, your article with Gordana about Provenius cluster categories. And then there, there, there is this Provenius category that, uh, that you guys define with, which cow, cow like started like thinking about this makes sense, but then it wasn't doing exactly what I wanted to do. Because I wanted to define a way that was not trivial and then get something that is actually meaningful for people in topological data analysis. But I'm still working on that to see if there is a connection or not. But then this is an example due to Noir and Floor. So then we are going to consider R and R opposite. So they are they going to be the posits given by the, these orders over the real numbers. And then we are going to consider M the sublattice of this cross product. And then this is described by this, this situation. So then these two lines uh, have a slope given by negative one. And then we are going to denote the, this, like a, this by, by using this symbol, the abelian category of persistent modules that go from M opposite to the category of K vector spaces. Here K denotes always a, a field. So then we say that a persistent module like this is pointwise finite dimensional, provide that for every object U in M, the dimension of the corresponding vector space is finite. We are going to say that it's cohomological, that provide that if you have this um, inequality of, of, of objects in M, then you obtain this a, a, a long exact sequence of k vector space. And then we say that it's sequentially continuous, provided you have an increasing sequence of objects in M that are converging to a specific element U in M, then you have this isomorphism of vector spaces. So then this, this, this inequality here, this increasing sequence induces a, 
inverse system. So then you can talk about the inverse limit. So then it turns out that it is continuous provided that you have that isomorphism. And then the support of V is the set of all elements um, U in M such that the V of U is not equal to zero. So then um, we denote by this curly J, the full subcategory of these persistent modules that consists of those persistent modules that are PDF, cohomological, sequentially continuous, and with bonded support. Um, then we define the, the ones that are J presentable. So then they are going to consist in all those uh, uh, persistent modules that can fit into a, an exact sequence of this kind, where W1 and W2 are also L, uh, uh, objects in the category J. So then we denote by press J the full subcategory of persistent modules that are J presentable functions. Then this is the theorem. So the category press J is a provenance category with J uh, being the category of projective injective objects. So then, and then more than that, every persistent module in press J at least a minimal projective resolution. So then we have, when we talk about the, the stable category, this provenance category, we have a, a, um, a triangular category. Now, how the, 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 the composable projective injective objects look like? They look like something like this. And that will be for every, every object in the lattice. So then we have a, a continuous Frobenius category in this sense. And then this is this T verse, so I should have mentioned. So then it's obtained from V by, well, so then the idea is that you connect here, you connect here, and then you have uh, this, this rectangle, and then this will be the uh, T inverse of V. And then I cannot help but notice, but this somehow looks similar to me when you define the projective and objective objects over the, when, when you describe the objective projective objects over the module category of a repetitive algebra. Because then in one, in one term you have the injective object and then another term you have a projective object. And then notice that this, is, this guy can also be the injective object corresponding to this one right here. So then, then there is something there and then, and then I don't know if there is one way of connecting or not, but I always, when I see this, that the description of the composable projective objects over repetitive algebra comes to my mind. And then, <clears throat> so then, since we can we can define we can define uh, projective resolutions here, we can talk about the x functors. But then now we have to be careful here. So we are going to consider C, the abelian category of persistent modules such that they vanish at the boundary of M. So that they vanish over these diagonal lines. And then the, we define the associate simple functor. So then it's going to assign to the object UK. And then everything else is going to be equal to zero. And therefore you have a, an Euler function that is defined in this way. So then, so then it's the Euler characteristic. Now, um, when you define a W of V of U, so then by using the absolute value, so then you obtain in a, a, in a sub way in the use in the in the sense that I define the in this in this presentation. And then by just applying what we had done uh, before, so then we get this uh, equality corresponding to this exact way now defined by using the Euler characteristic. Moreover, we also define, have this version of that inequality that was proved by Bougueni and the others, uh, but in terms of the Euler characteristic. Now, <clears throat> this is so far what we have found in, in, in this research, but then uh, the, 
The idea is that we are looking to find a close relationship with extended cohomology persistence, zigzag persistence, and the major, uh, major Victoria experiment theorem. In the sense of, uh, of Carson and others that uh, was exposed in 2009. So then, how many minutes I have left? Thirty seconds or can I have one minute? So, so then this is the idea. So then that's how you relate the ordinary extended relative uh, a persistence of a of, of a persistent module, and then um, here is the what I have prepared so far. So then this is an example from Odu, uh, Odu's book. Uh, uh, Persistence theory from fewer representations to that analysis. So then uh, this is a Morse function. And then you have you have these level sets. So that measure the height of this of this function with respect to those uh, singular points. And then you have this one right here, and then you can obtain this long exact sequence of vector spaces. So notice that here we consider ordinary persistence and here relative persistence, no existence, but persistence. And then whatever uh, feature that is born here, but it dies over the relative side is what we call the extended persistence of that persistent motion. So this, this diagram here, is actually the standard persistence diagram corresponding to the Morse function. Now, we also have interleaver sets, and then we have a zigzag persistent module. So then it's explicitly given by this in terms of dimensions of the k-vector spaces. And then we have this in the composable one. And then the idea is that to this uh, persistent in the composable persistent zigzag module, we associate associate this big pyramid, which we call the major victorious pyramid. And then there is an algorithm that allows you to just fill these guys we want. But then the idea is that you keep in mind what they call the major victorious diamonds. And then you also want to fill these guys with ones or zeros in order to be sure that you keep that this long exact sequence is exact. And then notice that here, this corresponds to, this corresponds to the standard persistence and then this corresponds to regular persistence, ordinary persistence, but then this guy can be associated with this one here and then you obtain what well, we want this guy right here. And that is the type of a, pro, a projective injective decomposable audit that we are discussing in this. Thank you so much. I was wondering if there's any connection between what you're looking at and Bragg functions on triangulated categories. What was that again? I was wondering if there's any connection between what you're studying and Bragg functions on triangulated categories. No, I, I don't think so. I, I, I don't know. So I have to, to learn what these bright functions are. Bragg functions. Bragg functions. Mm. Yeah. I can't remember the exact definition, but uh, I think so. some of the definitions are quite similar. I like the triangular. Okay, but I can look into it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll look into it. Okay.